This is the book Winchy, Mission Stories of Colin and Melva Winch by S. Ross Goldstone. The true adventures of missionary pilots and nurses in the South Pacific, as retold to the children of Watertown SDA Church. I'm your storyteller, Austin Backus. Let's go. This week's story, first chapter is called Mechanical Difficulties. Tari is located in a valley in the southern highlands at an elevation of approximately 5,400 feet and is serviced by a commercial airstrip. District Director Alwyn Galloway asked Colin to fly supplies to Como Mananda, a landing strip 10 minutes by air from Tari. Hiking time would have been two days. Colin was happy to assist knowing this would involve three flights shuttling the goods to the short landing strip at Como Mananda. This could be dangerous in windy conditions. With the first load tightly secured and a national passenger in the co-pilot seat of the Cessna 180, Colin took off from Tari and made a successful landing at Como Mananda where the cargo was unloaded. He then returned to Tari and successfully repeated the procedure. Now the Tari airport has a long runway with a windsock at each end and one in the middle. Often these three windsocks can be blowing in different directions, making landing a matter of guesswork. As Colin made the approach to Tari after his second delivery, he noted that he would be landing in a crosswind, but would, but would run into a headwind at the other end of the runway. He was comfortable with the situation and landed on one wheel to counteract the wind. It was a classic crosswind touchdown, and Colin congratulated himself, hoping Alwyn Galloway had seen and noticed it. Without warning, a strong gusting tailwind hit the tail of the aeroplane, causing the nose of the plane to pitch down while the tail rose alarmingly. Colin pulled back on the control column to rectify the situation, but it jammed. No matter how hard he pulled, it would not budge. He saw gravel rushing past the nose. At any moment, the propeller would strike the surface of the runway, and the plane would flip onto its back. He was facing a certain crash. God help me, he cried. All of a sudden, the tail was pushed down as if some giant hand had put weight on it. He was thrown forward in his harness. Shaking with fear, he yanked at the control column, trying to free it without success. It was still jammed. Eventually, he taxied to the parking bay, killed the motor, and sat in the cockpit, trembling. It had been the closest he had ever been to crashing a plane. Alwyn walked around and opened the plane door. Seeing Colin's white face, he asked, What's wrong with you, Winchy? Didn't you see what just happened back there? Colin responded, No, I was reading. I didn't see anything. Try this control column, suggested the pilot. It remained jammed against Alwyn's attempt to move it. A search revealed that a small piece of fiberglass had come loose and had jammed the elevator just as the plane touched down. Fortunately, this did not happen at Como Mananda, such a little thing, but what frightening consequences of God had not intervened. On another occasion, Colin, Elwyn Raithel, and a friend of the Raithel family known as Auntie Doris had visited Pastor Paul Piari, who was pioneering the work at Kiunga. They taxied to the end of the grass airstrip, about to make their return flight to Mount Hagen. As Colin turned 180 degrees to position the plane for takeoff, they heard a loud bang in the tail section. It was immediately evident that the rudder spring had broken. These light planes were fitted with two opposing rudder springs that hold the rudder in the straight-ahead position, but now the one good spring was holding the rudder hard to one side, making it difficult to get the plane to track in a straight line. Colin taxied slowly back to their starting point and by radio advised the Department of Civil Aviation and Mission Headquarters of their predicament. They explained their problem to Pastor Paul and he readily agreed to share his humble home with them for the night. The house was built of bush materials and privacy was minimal. Auntie Doris viewed the circumstances in the house with apprehension. She had lived through the pioneering days of Dora Creek, but had never lived in a building as insecure as this one. She had learned that very day that there were cannibals in the bush, perhaps not far away. They showed her the only spare room in the house and told her it was hers. Colin and Elwyn slept on the veranda just outside her room. It was an uneventful night, but a fitful sleep. With no replacement spring available by the third day, Colin decided it was time for action. After several practice runs on the airstrip and noting the good weather, he decided to take off from Mount Hagen. Between the two men, they were able to hold the plane on course by maintaining constant pressure on the rudder pedal. The two-hour flight proved uneventful, and Auntie Doris declared the experience to be the highlight of her trip to New Guinea. The next chapter is called, They Heralded the King. The King's Heralds are coming! Word spread quickly from mission station to mission station, from village to village, excitement mounted. The music produced by the King's Heralds had won the hearts of parents and children alike throughout the Solomon Islands. Their songs were sung often in four-part harmony by toddlers playing on the sandy beaches or splashing in the waters of the lagoons. King's Herald songs indelibly recorded in their minds, adults form quartets singing in harmony, difficult to differentiate from that of the King's Heralds themselves. Now Solomon Islanders were to have the opportunity to see, touch, and hear their heroes of gospel music. 
Their first visit took place during Colin and Melva's first year of mission service. The Adventists at Kukudu determined to give the king's heralds a traditional welcome. Dressed as fierce warriors with war paint, sounding war cries, wielding war implements, and performing war dances, they had spent weeks getting it choreographed. As the Varivato arrived with the long-awaited guests on board, they were greeted by an intimidating spectacle. This welcome spectacle over, everyone wanted to shake hands with the celebrities. The King's Heralds were humble men and were overwhelmed by the warmth of the welcome, and the vast numbers who had gathered to hear them sing. Nationals traveled from all over the Western Solomons. Some even paddled for two days by canoe to be there. The Arovo, or meeting house, was packed to capacity, and a hush fell over the audience as the quartet was about to sing. Many of those present had adored the King's Herald's music for years. As the beautiful harmonies rang out, there was thunderous applause that seemed to go on forever. Colin observed the audience sat open-mouthed in awe and deep respect as song after song added to the rapturous atmosphere. No doubt the visitors retired to their beds that night with a great sense of satisfaction, but they were not to get a good sleep. The rats saw to that. Colin and Melva occupied the most commodious house on the Kukudu mission station and were happy to provide accommodation for the honored guests. Having settled them in their rooms, Colin and Melva retired to their bed, but were disturbed by a commotion from the visitors' part of the house. Dressed in his pajamas, Colin knocked on one of the doors to hear a very agitated, Come in! Opening the door, he saw two of the king's heralds standing on their beds, peering down at a large Solomon Island rat. The earlier welcome by the warriors had not daunted them, but the intrusion of this rodent sure did. The second tour by the king's heralds took place early in 1973. Colin met them at Port Moresby and flew them in the J.L. Tucker to their various appointments throughout Papua New Guinea. Before departure, each member was weighed with their luggage. This was standard procedure for all passenger flights, as there were legal load limits in place, and Colin rigidly adhered to these limits. A second plane was used to transport their sound equipment. As with all visitors, the King's Heralds marveled at the scenes laid out below them, huge rivers with their wide deltas, towering jagged mountains with sheer cliff faces. The men seated in the back of the plane had a better view than the passenger in the front who looked out over the wing. They soon recognized the skill involved in flying a small plane in such a land of contrast, but felt secure with Colin as their captain, knowing that before takeoff he would always commit all involved into the care of a loving God. King's Heralds experienced firsthand the difficulty of fulfilling all appointments. Clouded in mountains often made flying hazardous, and the search for a way over the mountain passes sometimes proved futile. Such was the case when an attempt was made to meet an appointment at Kabiufa. Hundreds of the local people had gathered in this eastern highland center in anticipation of hearing the songs they knew so well from the singers themselves. The weather was not good, and Colin flew back and forth trying to find a safe hole or break in the clouds. Proximity to the jagged rocks peeping through the clouds was a foreboding sight to those unaccustomed to such conditions. Finally, the attempt had to be aborted, and one can only imagine the disappointment of those assembled. But there were more successful flights than disappointing ones. Jim McClintock, the King's Herald's bass singer from 1962 to 1977, recalled landing at the Crushed Coral Airstrip at Emerald. At the time of the visit by the King's Heralds, the Seventh Avenue's mission planes were the only ones using it. The trees were growing back, but there was sufficient clearing for the mission planes to land. The Adventist members had marked out a place for the group to stand. A couple of primitively dressed and adorned nationals performed their cannibalistic war dances, providing an atmosphere of realism from their pre-Christian past, before singing of a different nature could be heard coming from under the trees. Quite a large group came marching and singing until they were all in front of the King's Heralds, demonstrating the transformation brought about by the Gospel. It was an emotional experience that brought tears to the eyes of the visitors. The three-hour trip to Musau had to be made by sea, as there was no landing strip on Musau. The King's Heralds boarded the Malalagi ship, but soon three of them suffered from seasickness. Being used to the sea, Jerry Patton made light of his fellow singer's predicament, even describing what each had eaten that morning as he watched them lose their breakfast overboard. On landing at Boliu, still feeling unwell but happy to be on dry land, the singers faced a sea of a different nature, a sea of expectant faces. The Musa people loved singing and the King's Heralds were their heroes. Still others had crossed the sea from Emerald to be present. So big was the crowd that the performance had to be shifted from the school auditorium to the sports ground. A fabulous evening of gospel music was enjoyed by all. The local people sang in their beautiful harmony to the King's Heralds, who responded by singing to the crowd. Long into the evening, the music wafted on the tropical breezes. There were just a few hours left for the King's Heralds to snatch a little sleep before boarding the Malalagi for their return to Emerald. Colin affirmed that the visit of the King's Heralds did more to bring together the church in the Western Solomons than anything he had ever known. Be sure to tune in next time for more stories from the book Winchy by S. Ross Goldstone, which is available at the Adventist Book Center. And meanwhile, check out these videos and others on my channel with many more mission stories and Bible skits for kids and adults. God bless you.